This is Anne-Marie Pizzatelli, and I'm the Global Head of Marketing Built Environment for BSI. Climate change is one of the most important issues facing the built environment today, and one for which building owners and managers must dedicate significant attention. This presentation will study the intersection between climate and the built environment to provide a, a holistic understanding of the factors involved. Our expert today will cover such topics as climate resilience, adaptation versus mitigation, climate-related regulations and their relationship to the industry, integrating an uncertain climate risk into project planning. I would now like to introduce today's speaker. Keith Bryan is the Director of Built Environment at the BSI Group. Keith leads the built environment sector for BSI Americas, representing the full portfolio of products and services for clients and key st stakeholders. He offers a variety of experience, integrating holistic solutions into the built environment, including greenhouse gas accounting, climate change risk management, energy efficiency, resilience, environment, social governments, and green building programs. Prior to U.S. government consulting, Keith worked for the U.S. Green Building Council as a program integration manager for certification operations teams, where he was responsible for the strategic development of certification programs for existing and emerging U.S. GBC certification programs. Please welcome Keith Bryan. Thanks, Anne-Marie. It's great to be here. Great to see you, Keith. Um, I'd just like to go before we begin over some webinar logistics. Um, our webinar will run for 60 minutes today with some time for Q&A at the end. You have joined a muted webinar, so you should be able to hear us clearly. Now on the next slide, uh, if you would like to ask us a question, please have a look for the questions box and type your question. We'll do our best to answer these as they come in. Uh, or I actually, we'll do our best to answer these at the end of the webinar today. And if you can't hear us, please use the question box and indicate this in the question box and our technical support will help you. I'd just like to let everyone know that all participants today will receive some great featured handouts, including our sustainability report from BSI, a green print for a sustainable built environment, plus our very popular little book of BIM, plus we have some other great handouts. However, you must complete the post-event survey in order to get all these great uh, materials and content. I will give a reminder before the end of today's webinar. Now, we have some polls in our webinar today, so I encourage everyone to take part. It's a great way to uh, engage with the audience and gain in insight as well. So I think our first poll may be coming up right now. So I'm going to now launch our first poll. And our poll is, how comfortable is your organization with the concepts of climate change risk management? Uh, you may never heard of it. We have never heard of it. These are the uh, answers. We know about it, but have not started it. We have a mature climate risk management program. Other, please answer in the chat or question box. So organizers and panelists don't vote. So how comfortable is your organization with the concept of climate risk management? Uh, first answer, we have never heard of it. Uh, second, we know about it, but have not started it. Uh, third option is we have a mature climate risk management program. Fourth option, answer in chat, and we'll take a look at your answers. So I'm going to give everybody a chance to vote. I see people are still voting. I will close the poll, though, in five seconds so we can look at the results. So in five, four, three, two, one, I will now close the poll, and I will now share the results. So it looks like. Um, sharing the results. 16% have never heard of it. 52% know about it but have not started it. 28% have a mature climate risk management program and others will take a look in the chat. So Keith, um, any surprises for you here? Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I, I'm actually surprised at the uh, the top one there, the 16% that have never heard of it. That's uh, that's great. And thank you for, for joining today. So hopefully you come out of today's webinar with a little bit more information and a lot more questions. And we're happy to, to field those in following uh, follow-up webinars. 
Great, thank you all for voting. And now I'm gonna pass this over to uh, Keith. See if I can get the slides to advance here. All right, thank you, Henry. Uh, so first, uh, let me just say a, a big welcome to everybody for joining the webinar. Uh, this is a, a really interesting topic and uh, it's uh, super dynamic and you know, rapidly evolving. So it, it's great to see uh, so much interest in this. Uh, I've gotten a, a ton of emails just over the last week as I've been advertising this. So um, before we dive in, I just to like to give you know some general perspective about what we're even uh, talking about today. Oops. Uh, you may have heard some discussions about climate risk, but are you know unsure of what that even encompasses. Uh, so you know this discussion is meant to be uh, what I would call a high level you know 101 introduction to to climate risk. Um, what's important to note is that climate risk planning is no longer uh, an add-on or a nice to have. Um, financially, it just makes sense. And uh, furthermore, now there are numerous laws and agreements and best practices and rules uh, that that are pointing to the need for incorporation of climate considerations into uh, business planning, project planning, etc. Uh, on the screen here uh, is just a, a list of I would call this an illustrative list of some of the things that are out there right now. Uh, so, you know, starting at that global level, we have uh, we have you know climate related uh, agreements and whatnot that go uh, you know all the all the way back to the Kyoto Protocol in the late 90s. Uh, more recently, and I'm sure a lot of people have heard of the Paris Agreement in 2015. There's the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, etc. And, you know, and all those are at a global agreement level, because as we all know, climate change is a, a global issue, not just a, a single country issue. Uh, if we shift to the, the national level, there uh, again, there's a variety of laws and regulations and whatnot. Uh, the one I want to really point out is something that happened recently uh, down at the bottom there, that SEC proposed rule. Uh, so this pertains to climate risk uh, um uh, disclosure in your, your financial statement. So we'll get to that in just a moment. There are also uh, specific regional laws. There are you know, ISOs and best practices and reporting frameworks. We'll get to some of that uh, later on in the conversation. But I just wanted to point out that this is, you know, this is not something that is just a, a side discussion that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, tree huggers like me are, are having. Uh, this is a very important issue to uh, just about every business globally. So just to give you some context, um, here are some events um, you know, that have happened recently that you may have caught in the news. Um, so on the top left there, like I mentioned, the SEC recently proposed a rule to require companies to disclose any climate risks that have or that are likely to have material impact on their businesses. Uh, now, this rule is still in the comment period, but uh, it, you know, it sent a, a fairly large shockwave through um, through the business community, uh, who are still kind of uh, dealing with how they're going to report uh, to some of these requirements when it when it does uh, come to pass. Now, the one of the things that uh, is important to to mention about that rule, it does have what I would call cutoffs for smaller organizations which I, I've heard some comments about, oh, well, you know, we will likely be exempt from that rule because we're a smaller smaller business. The thing to realize here is that uh, this is essentially touching on everything through uh, scope three greenhouse gas emissions, which cover supply chain. So even if your organization isn't directly required to report under that proposed rule, uh, some of the organizations that you sell to or report up to in your value, value chain are going to start asking questions uh, about that. So it's good to be prepared uh, for what sorts of things those customers uh, are going to be asking of you. The image on the top right there is um, it's showing the financial severity of climate related disasters uh, last year in 2001, just in the United States, obviously. Um, just for reference, there were 20 uh, billion dollar or above events last year in the US alone. Uh, so obviously you can see there's a, there's a financial implication just on the, the physical risk aspect uh, of this. 
And at the bottom, this actually just came out uh, this week, the Securities and Exchange Commission fined BNY Mellon uh, $1.5 million for greenwashing, uh, for essentially not following their own internal ESG inter uh, review process. Um, now, to be fair, $1.5 million for them is, is very little. Uh, you know, I, I would call that a, a rounding error, error for a company like that. But uh, but the point was made, and, and it, I, I would say it established a little bit of a precedent for the direction that we're heading. That you know, the, the writing is on the wall uh, for for those types of misstatements, whether um, intentional or not, uh, in in uh, risk uh, financial statements going out. And then uh, just last week. Uh, HSBC's Stuart Kirk actually downplayed climate change as a financial risk uh, to the delight of some and the horror of others, uh, including the CEO of HSBC, who was you know, pretty quick to refute Kirk's claims uh, and actually place him on suspension. Um, it's, in my opinion, it's important not to completely cast aside uh, the views of, of folks like Mr. Kirk, because it shows that um, there remains an overly narrow financial and wealthy nation approach to how many are viewing uh, climate change as a whole. Uh, so, you know, I bring this up and I put this on the screen, not to uh, chastise uh, Mr. Kirk or his views, uh, but rather to uh, challenge folks like myself to just do a better job explaining what climate risk is all about and the metrics that are involved beyond just the obvious market related financial risks. So, uh, okay, moving on. So, you know, fundamentally, there are two different ways that we can talk about climate change. Uh, from a risk perspective, business need, businesses need to think about uh, both of them. So, I'm going to go through these two areas and talk a little bit about you know, what, what you can expect to hear from stakeholders and you know, just give some high level suggestions for addressing each of them, uh, just so you're not caught completely flat footed uh, or unaware about what's being requested or, or what you should expect to see uh, in the near future. So we'll talk about these in just a moment. Um, First, however, you know, I'd like to define what we even mean when we're talking about climate risk. Now, I think if I had to guess, I would say most people, when they hear the term climate risk, immediately think of what the task force on climate related financial disclosures would define as physical risks. Um, so these uh, as you can see on the left there, these break down into uh, two categories. Both uh, are likely very familiar to even the most casual follower of the subject. Um, first is acute events, so event-driven events, things like hurricanes, flooding, fire, uh, things that have direct immediate impact uh, on you know, physical assets and otherwise, right? Uh, the other being what we would call chronic events, and you're, and you're probably uh, familiar with this as well. This is things like um, shifts in climate, so uh, areas becoming uh, drier or wetter over time, heat waves, uh, sea level rise, et cetera, et cetera, things that cause uh, long-term changes in uh, uh, climate. Uh, beyond that, um, you know, it, it's important to note that uh, with a, a quickly changing business landscape, there's this whole other element of climate related risks that uh, TCFD defines as uh, transition risks. So things like the SEC's proposed rule for greenhouse gas emissions and risk disclosure that I just mentioned a moment ago, or uh, general consumer viewpoint fall into this category. So, you know, these are things like policy and legal challenges that might face uh, organizations if they're unable to report their data accurately and therefore can't report their risks accurately. That could have an impact on their business. 
uh, technology is constantly changing to be able to not only report, but uh, track energy systems, track impacts, track risks, assess risks, et cetera. And as organizations uh, are getting more into this playing field, they have to assess that, uh, you know, not only the cost, but the implementation risks of new technology, et cetera. Uh, market risks as climate impacts uh, things, there are shifts in supply and demand. Uh, there, there are shifts in you know what areas can grow food, for example, uh, and that obviously has uh, downstream impacts for a variety of business. So you need to think about things not only from the perspective of, of uh, your organization and the direct uh, potential physical impacts of that, but what can you expect to see coming from your providers and suppliers and et cetera. And then, of course, the the last one you know we're seeing in, in things like these uh, fines from the SEC. Greenwashing claims uh, are you know, rampant at, at the moment. Uh, this is just reputational risk, right? So uh, customers, consumers, et cetera, uh, are expecting organizations to be more transparent uh, in, in how they dis disclose, uh, you know, not only their approach to greenhouse gas mitigation, but also their, their approach to risk, financial and otherwise. Um, so um, just moving on here. Hopefully the slide will change in a moment. Okay, there we go. Uh, so, you know, beyond that, even when we are talking about uh, physical risks, you know, so those uh, acute and chronic physical risks, the most obvious risk isn't always the only one. So, um, for instance, it's easy to think about uh, the potential direct physical damage caused by a hurricane or flooding, uh, but any large scale physical damage like that uh, almost always has downstream implications. So for instance, if you live in an area that's uh, supplied by nuclear power and the area that that power plant sits is subject to a heat wave, well, nuclear power plants uh, use water uh, to, to cool, and they can no longer cool their systems when uh, the temperature outside gets to a certain point. Uh, so they are uh, often, and it's happened uh, several times in the last few years here in the United States, they're often forced to shut down, uh, interrupting that power supply or uh, you know, diverting the, the demand over to a different energy source, which puts a strain on that grid. So you know th this can be something that happens hundreds of miles away from where you reside but it still has a, a very direct uh, impact on your business as a whole so these impacts to your supply chain cause that ripple effect that go uh, far beyond that initial physical risk and far beyond the risk to just a a, a very small uh, physical area so you know if you if you live in the middle of, of Ohio, that doesn't necessarily mean that your power is not going to get erupted if you're supplied by, by nuclear. So, okay. So I just want to cover this slide uh, just to go over the, the basics of risk management. Now, this um, this is a very high level. So if there are any risk managers on the line, uh, you know, uh, understand that this <laughs> this is meant to be a skim. Uh, so basics of risk management. There there are uh, different pillars that we, we, that we would talk about, uh, but these are four of the main components, right? So the first is just to understand where your organization sits as far as as far as risk. So uh, the first step in any risk management program is to create a comprehensive risk profile. That's understanding uh, and identifying all the risks uh, that are evident in your supply chain, in, in your uh, business, et cetera. Right, so just listing everything out uh, and understanding not only what risks are there, but the likelihood of those uh, risks happening. Right, so a um, great example would be something like New York City, which got hit by Hurricane Sandy uh, a few years back. Um, yes, uh, there, there is certainly a risk of a hurricane hitting New York City. Uh, however, that might rank a little bit uh, lower on the risk scale than uh, some other more immediate impacts in that area. So 
So it's important just to create that risk pro profile, lay everything out, and understand uh, where your organization sits. Uh, the same risk does not uh, Im impact different organizations uh, the same way. The second one down, uh, I, I like to talk about the concept of just transferring risk when possible. So this can go anywhere from uh, opportunities to use a, a vendor. So for instance, if you're trying to run your own in-house energy management program and that's not really your expertise, um, it might be wise to outsource that, that sort of uh, work so that you know that you're following industry best practices, you know that you're following um, standards and, and uh, you know uh, the, the way things that are that are done in the industry. This can also uh, be things like for projects uh, shifting the entire operations of a building through something like a public-private partnership, shifting that so that a different organization does all the operations and maintenance and uh, and whatnot of your building uh, to make sure that that uh, building operation is no longer a risk to uh, your particular organization. Next one down is clearly defining the governments, uh, gov governments, excuse me. Uh, you know, and that's just what's impactful to your organization. I spoke about this uh, a moment ago, but different risks impact organizations differently, right? So, um, you know, that that power risk, if you have uh, renewable energy backup, backup or islanded systems, that's going to have a, a different impact on you than if you rely solely on the grid. And then uh, it's important to think about all of these risks from a life cycle perspective. So, um, you know, it, it's important to not only reevaluate your risk profile uh, occasionally, but also to understand when you're talking about something like climate risk, uh, the, the, the risks change over time. So if you look at something like sea level rise, uh, that is not going to be the same 10 years from now as it is 30 years from now. So understanding that the, there's that uh, decadal uh, change in impact is important to define that risk profile. Okay, so this slide was repeated intentionally. Uh, you know, Like I said, there are two different elements uh, of, of how we discuss climate change. The first is mitigation, and this is just uh, what we can do to reduce emissions stabilizing the the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere so uh you know how much energy you use uh, how how um you know what types of energy uh, supply your fleet your buildings etc um so there are ways to impact this uh, three of them are listed here one is just the reduction of burning of fossil fuels a second is uh increasing uh, what's known as carbon sinks or you know absorption of carbon a variety of ways to do that we'll get to that in a moment and then just changing the, the materials or the way that you do business can often have a, a mitigation impact. The other side of the house is adaptation. So this is bracing for anything that it, we already know is going to happen. We know that sea levels are rising, right? So even if we were to stop greenhouse gas emissions from rising, uh, sea levels will still rise for a, a number of years. So we have to plan for that in our uh, physical and transition risk planning. Uh, there's also continuity planning, you know, things like understanding that if something happens to one of our, our buildings or our supply chains, that we need to have a backup plan uh, in case that happens. And then uh, when we are building new things or designing new systems, we are designing those with climate change in mind, uh, understanding that it might not be a good idea to build right next to the ocean if the sea levels are expected to rise in 10 years. So uh, we will start with adaptation. Um, there, you know, building owners, operators uh, face a uh, complex array of challenges related to uh, sustainable operations or resilient operations of, of their facilities, um, especially as it relates to infrastructure and energy usage, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. So, um, as I mentioned, there's a variety of things that you can do right now. Um, this list that you're about to see is not exhaustive in, in any way, shape, or form. Um, but we can do things like uh, infrastructure hardening, so putting up physical barriers. Uh, easiest example of something like this is the levee systems used in, in New Orleans, right? That is a physical stop 
to uh, sea level rise that uh, is coming towards the, the, the city itself. Um, ongoing monitor or early warning detection system. So you see this in flood warning systems, but there are other ways to uh, screen for the uh, effects of drought, high winds, et cetera. We use a, uh, a climate risk planning software uh, that, we, that we can help people understand those risks. Uh, efficiency upgrades. So, you know, people don't think of uh, changing your uh, your efficiency of, of your lighting or your HVAC or, or what have you as um, a climate adaptation necessarily, uh, but it, it really is. Less consumption, you know, if your building uses less energy, that means that in the case of a ca catastrophic event that knocks out your power and you having to switch over to generators or uh, islanded renewables or, or something of that sort, um, it's gonna it's gonna last for longer, right? Um, so in, in the case of a power interruption, you have uh, more time to recover or back up or manage critical systems. <coughs> Excuse me. I think one of the uh, most obvious but often overlooked aspects of um, resilience or ad adaptation is ecosystem conservation. Um, so you know, natural barriers, things like mangroves or plants that absorb uh, and transpire groundwater, uh, they help to prevent flooding and runoff and mudslides and things of that sort. And then uh, last but not least, of course, uh, economic adaptation planning. So financially planning how we're gonna handle a major event in the case that that happens. So you can do that through either proactive or uh, reactive steps. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So the next thing we can do is uh, continuity planning. And we've talked about this a little bit in the previous slide. Uh, so, you know, this is just acknowledging it's going to happen. Uh, what do we do when it does? And that's that whole concept of adapt adaptation planning, ec economic adaptation planning, et cetera. Um, you know, just saying when our building gets destroyed, we're gonna apply for FEMA funding is, is uh, you know, maybe not the best adaptation planning. Uh, so this is things like uh, creating devolution plans, emergency response plans, um, identifying your critical infrastructure. So if uh, in the event of an emergency, you know what you need to back up, whether that's people or uh, systems or buildings in, in uh, the entirety uh, or supply chains or what have you. And then just identification of low or no cost opportunities. So constant awareness of that risk profile uh, and small changes that you can continuously make to reduce that risk uh, are helpful in reducing the, the risk profile of your organization. For, for instance, um, most hurricane damage is not caused by high winds or rain, it's caused by flying debris. So understanding that and mitigating that risk prior to a hurricane can actually uh, help with your uh, your risk management planning. So placing outdoor items uh, that could turn into flying debris uh, into storage prior to a major wind event is a very simple, low cost or no cost uh, thing that you can do to mitigate risk. And then as we look at, you know, look towards the future, you can still factor adaptation uh, into your planning. So this is things like designing with uh, climate change in mind. So updating your design standards to have higher wind tolerances or uh, you know, not put vegetation close to your buildings in case of a, a fire. Or I mentioned New York City, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, one of the biggest damages from Hurricane Sandy was flooding. Uh, and one of the results of that is that most of the critical equipment for buildings has now been moved up to higher floors. So in the case of flooding, Yes, they have a flooded basement or a parking garage, but their critical systems, their HVAC, uh, their, their water, et cetera, are not uh, affected by the by those uh, disaster events. Of course, uh, you know if you're you're joining a webinar by BSI, we're going to talk about the incorporation of standards. So there's a variety of standards out there. I'll get to a few of them in a moment. Uh, but these these standards provide that framework that are, is needed to uh, properly assess and mitigate climate risk. So uh, it's important, if, especially if you're just starting down this pathway, uh, to 
refer to some of those to really make sure that you're, you're covering all your bases. And I mentioned previously uh, that there are decadal changes in climate risk factors, right? So uh, 10 years from now, 30 years from now, are gonna have different risk profiles. Uh, so just understanding that that is not a static risk and you need to uh, constantly update that. So on the mid mitigation side, there's a variety of things you can do. Um, some of these are on the reporting side, some of these are on the actual greenhouse gas mitigation side. I'm gonna kind of fly through these. Uh, just, uh, just I think most people are aware of many of these, so I'll mention them, but I'm not gonna really focus on them. Uh, so the first one is reduction in the burning of fossil fuels. Um, so you know things like alternative fuel vehicles, uh, alternative fuels as an energy source for your building, solar, wind, geothermal, etc. Um, there are hybrid fuel systems out there, both for uh, cars, you know, fleets, as well as uh, building systems, things like uh, combined heat and power. Uh, upgrading your equipment, of course, uh, has uh, an effect on the amount of energy that your equipment uses. So, you know, if you have older equipment, um, you know, bringing that energy use down, it could be just a matter of uh, upgrading your equipment itself. Uh, as far as uh, re reduce transportation distances. So there are ways to um, look at your supply chain for whenever you're uh, buying materials for the operations of your buildings and buy things that are more local in order to reduce uh, your uh, downstream emissions or, or you know, reduce emissions that are caused by you um, in, in organizational processes. That speaks to that alternate processes bullet as well. Second one is uh, carbon sinks. Now, uh, there are a variety of ways to do this. You know, we always hear about uh, planting more trees. Uh, we, we, we hear about things like this uh, picture on the right, which is a direct air capture uh, technology in uh, Iceland, I believe, and, uh, and things of that sort. So that, that's all good. Um, you know, when you're designing new, new buildings, it's important to look at the amount of embodied carbon in the materials. Uh, you can actually sequester carbon in uh, building materials if you make the right building choices. It's also uh, good to realize that the earth has natural carbon sinks. So maintaining biodiversity in your projects, if you're building a new building or whatnot, uh, helps you to uh, reduce the amount of uh, carbon emissions or gives you that, uh, that offset. <coughs> Excuse me. Last thing uh, that we're gonna talk about here is just uh, changes in materials or processes. So I mentioned uh, lower embodied carbon. So this is just a choice that you can make during the design process to source materials from other suppliers uh, that are more transparent about the makeup of their products or uh, intentionally are choosing lower carbon materials. You can also do things, of course, like recycling, um, you know, going carbon free for your material choices looking at alternative material choices uh, for carbon, et cetera. Uh, and, then, and then of course, uh, just energy efficiency is is always a component of this. Um, you can also make changes to your process. So I think the uh, most immediate thing that people think about is, uh, you know, what can we do as a substitution in our process? So rather than using a high carbon material, we would use a lower carbon material. So, um, you know, uh, using wood instead of steel in, in construction or something like that. But uh, often there are opportunities to just change the process itself rather than substituting uh, a part of that process. So rethinking that entire process it is a way to actually um, mitigate climate change, right? So great example of this is prefabrication of materials. Prefabrication allows you to do a variety of, of benefits, but one of them is that uh, you don't have to sh ship all the materials to a construction site uh, and, and it reduces uh, transportation costs and, and, and uh, carbon emissions and whatnot. Sorry, my brain uh, went crazy there. Couldn't, couldn't think of what I wanted to say. All right, next slide. So in the uh, in the effort to uh, reduce carbon emissions and uh, make sure you're covering those transitional risks and physical risks and whatnot, there are a, a variety of opportunities for technology integration here. Um, 
technology is ever changing. Uh, so there, there are opportunities throughout the building life cycle to, to weave this into your existing processes. Everything from the design of buildings where we can really get down into the underlying data with things like uh, building information modeling, energy modeling, uh, like I mentioned before, material selection, climate risk planning. Uh, so there are softwares out there that help you understand what your physical and transitional risks are. So you don't uh, you don't have to you know head down that road alone, right? There are softwares that will help you do that based on your specific uh, lo location. So moving on to construction, of course, BIM, building information modeling is important for the operations uh, of the building, but uh, it also comes back to that construction phase. Uh, so this helps you plan in efficiencies during construction, helps you uh, reduce the number of things that, that you have to redo uh, because it wasn't uh, you know, communicated effectively uh, between teams, uh, things like that. So there are predictive analytics programs that, that can help you plan out construction processes based on current supply chain issues, uh, you know, material availability, et cetera, et cetera. When you get to the operational phase, uh, obviously there, there's tons of opportunities you know we hear digital twins and bim and, and whatnot uh talked about a lot uh i heard recently that somebody said this is digital tw twins are the most overhyped uh building technology and i i don't know where i sit on that but uh it is it is certainly that something that is not well defined but it uh, i have seen incredibly effective implementations of that that can help organizations not only understand their climate risk profile uh, but uh, weave that into their operational efficiencies in order to uh, just you know, reduce that risk on an ongoing basis, uh, not just a you know periodic basis. And then as we get to the decommissioning phase, obviously there's uh, there's a stated benefit of reusing materials and uh, and buildings. So that of course uh, reduces greenhouse gas emissions, uh, could reduce risk, et cetera. Okay. So I spoke before about uh, reporting frameworks. Uh, you know, we at BSI were one of the founding members of ISO. So I, obviously we, um, you know, uh, would like to point out that there are existing international standards that cover many of the elements of, of climate risk planning, right? So uh, here are just a few. These are not, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, at the top there, energy management is a huge component of not only climate risk planning, but also greenhouse gas emissions uh, management. Uh, so understanding how your energy management system is currently constructed and aligning that to best practices is very important from a risk management perspective. Uh, below that, we have ISO 14090. Uh, so this is actual physical adapt adaptation to climate change. Uh, so just you know, helping you align to generally accepted best practices as far as um, uh, climate change adaptation. Below that, greenhouse gas um, verification or how to report greenhouse gas uh, so that you don't get called out for things like uh, greenwashing and, and get fined a million dollars when when your uh, reports aren't, aren't aligning. Um, you know, the, these are all, like I said, you can certify to these systems to, to prove uh, that, that you're doing things the correct way. Uh, but more importantly, this establishes a, a framework. Uh, the one down the bottom there is PAS 2060. This is for carbon neutrality. So a lot of our organizations coming out of things like COP26 are shooting for carbon neutrality, either in the 2030 or 2050 timeframe. Um, how do you how do you get there? Can you mitigate all emissions uh, from your value chain? Maybe, uh, but if you can't, how do you then uh, offset those emissions so that you can then claim to be carbon neutral by your intended or stated uh, climate goals? And then all the systems that are there on the right, uh, there's those are either greenhouse gas management or energy management or um, climate risk management. Many of these actually align fairly nicely uh, to ISO standards. So the way I like to think about it is things like the greenhouse gas protocol uh, are you know, very popular. It's probably the most uh, used uh, framework for greenhouse gas reporting. Uh, there's actually a, a memorandum of understanding between ISO and uh, WRI, the creators of the greenhouse gas protocol, to align um, 
14064, the greenhouse gas management standard, uh, to the greenhouse gas protocol so that it doesn't create confusion in the market. So I like to think of 14064 as the uh, certification of something like the greenhouse gas protocol. But all of these provide some sort of framework to get started in understanding your greenhouse gas emissions, how to report those emissions, your um, risk profile when it comes to uh, climate risk planning, et cetera, how to mitigate those risks. So that about wraps up what I wanted to talk about. So I will turn it back over to Anne-Marie uh, to open it up for a poll and kind of close us out here. Thank you, Keith. That was great. So we've got our next poll question. And here we go. And I'll launch this poll. Which aspect of climate risk management would you like to learn more about in the next webinar? Keith covered a number of different topics today. But let us know what you'd like to hear more about in the next webinar. Physical risk and physical risk assessment and mitigation, transitional risk assessment and management, reporting frameworks and best practices, Others, please um, answer in the chat. So I'll give everybody a bit of time to vote in the poll. Um, we'll see what's happening here. Organizers and panelists don't vote. Um, so we've got here, which aspect of climate risk management would you like to learn more about in the next webinar? Physical risk assessment and mitigation. Our second choice is transitional risk assessment and management. The third is reporting frameworks and best practices. Uh, Keith just spoke about that. And other, please answer in the chat box. So I'll give everybody a chance to vote. I see we're still collecting uh, responses. So um, just think about that. What would our next webinar be about with our expert and uh, share more information? And I'm give, gonna give everybody five more seconds to vote so then we can share our results. So if everybody could make their selection and I'll close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. I will now close the poll and I will share the results. And it looks like uh, for our next webinar, 27% have indicated physical risk assessment and mitigation, 27% have indicated an interest in transitional risk assessment and management, 40% reporting frameworks and best practices. That's what was one of the later things, uh, uh, topics that Keith spoke about, and then other, we'll look at the chat box. So interesting results. Keith, any surprises here for you? No, that's great. Uh, so this is actually fairly well balanced. So that kind of indicates that uh, everybody wants to learn more about everything, which is uh, <laughs> always what I want to hear. Uh, like I said, physical risks, I, I think, are um, the most obvious when it comes to climate risk planning. But uh, when we start to back up and think about those downstream implications, those transitional risks and the management of those risks is really coming to life with the advent of things like these uh, SEC rules and, and fines, uh, sub subsequent fines. So uh, thank you. This was very helpful. Great. I'm going to hide the poll. And then we'll go on to our next slide. Uh, a little bit about BSI. Our purpose is inspiring trust for a more resilient world. We help to shape and guide innovation um, through imp improving and standardizing business processes, products, and services to enable advancement. We offer expertise, knowledge, innovation, and best practices. Uh, we are an integrated global enterprise with 84,000 clients in 193 countries across the world and 128,000 client sites. We have a strong global footprint and our clients range from globally recognized brands to small local businesses. Some information about our solutions. We have BSI training classes, both virtual, face-to-face -face, and on demand. So whichever you prefer with classes for a variety of ISO standards, including ISO 9001 and ISO 14001, which is actually the, the standard for environmental management systems. And we offer BIM training classes, building information modeling, uh, specifically for the built environment sector. We also offer ISO 19650 BIM verification and kite mark. Of course, we have our consulting services including sustainability solutions. If you're interested in any of our BSI solutions, please indicate this on the post-event survey, which will pop up as soon as the webinar is finished. Now, here are today's giveaways uh, on the next slide. Um, 
we have our sustainability report, a green print for a sustainable built environment. It's a really interesting report that I'm sure you'll really enjoy reading. We've got our little book of BIM uh, with all the BIM acronyms explained in detail, plus more information. We also have our clean energy and climate action in New York City paper, plus our BSI climate risk adaptation report. So please complete that survey to be able to access all of today's handouts. Now, we do have a time for a little bit of Q&A today. And um, let's see if we have some questions that have come in. We'll just take a look. Um, one question we have, Keith, is how would a company get started on a climate risk management program? How would they even get started? That's one of the questions that has come in today. Okay. Yeah. So uh, like I mentioned in uh, earlier in the presentation here, the most important thing that you can do to get started is to understand what risks uh, specifically apply to your organization, right? So um, this is things like assessing physical risks to your organization. So if you're um, you know, on, a, on a coast, uh, you're obviously going to have um, some potential sea level rise, et cetera. Um, and then how those risks actually uh, realistically impact your organization. So um, not only understanding what the risks are, but how likely they are to occur, uh, what the impacts of those risks uh, are if they do happen to your organization, and then start to think about what what are your, what are your backup plans. Uh, start from the highest level risks, uh, the ones that are going to be the biggest impact to your organization should they occur and start thinking about ways to mitigate those risks. So if, for instance, your high le highest level risk, um, say you're a uh, healthcare organization, a hospital or something of that sort, that uh, power loss would create a significant hazard. Uh, in that case, it could be a life or death situation. Um, hospitals are very proactive about managing uh, power risk, right? So you will almost always see uh, not not just three days of power generation backup, but often you know renewable energy systems, islanded grid systems, et cetera, for backup power uh, because they cannot afford uh, to lose power to to their hospital. So. Um, they proactively manage that by uh, initiating systems uh, to account for that risk. So that's just one example, but um, any risk has some sort of way to mitigate that. It's just a matter of understanding which ones are most impactful for your organization. Okay, great. Thank you, Keith. We have a big question here. How can uh, we achieve uh, global coordination to reduce greenhouse gas globally? Um, one of the many problems is that gas and diesel generators all over the world from California to New Delhi. How do we achieve greenhouse gas globally? That's a big question, reduction of greenhouse gas. Yeah, so I, I think there's a obviously a few elements uh, to this. So when you look at when you look like look at agreements like the Paris Agreement, that is that high-level agreement at, at the country level uh, that's committing to the de the decrease of greenhouse gas emissions over time. Um, now that at the country level, or the nation level, uh, has trickle-down effects, right? So as the country commits to a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions overall. Uh, they are then going to start, in some cases, implementing regulation, in other cases, implementing re reporting requirements. Um, the United States typically falls towards the, the reporting and transparency side of things rather than the regulation side of things. Um, we do see some regulatory changes. So, for instance, in the uh, most recent infrastructure bill, uh, we saw introduction of funding for things like um, electric vehicle uh, infrastructure throughout the nation, um, things like data uh, systems in order to you know, beef up that infrastructure uh, to enable 
companies to be able to uh, more effectively uh, communicate and and uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That sort of you know that all that nationwide effort trickles down, and and what you see is you, you get uh, I would say a, you know, an, an industry squeeze. You see the nation. Uh, the national level commitments and the consumer level commitments start to uh, put pressure on organizations uh, to better manage not only their risk profile, like if you're looking at it from a financial perspective, but also uh, just to to be better uh, stewards of of the environment, right? So um, we, consumers are often talking about voting with their pocketbooks or voting with their money, right? Uh, and so if they have the opportunity to go with an organization that is uh, a better steward of the environment, uh, we're seeing that a lot of times consumers are making that shift. It is that important to them. So um, the commitment at the national level is great. That, that's a great start, but uh, really, I think it has both that top-down uh, approach as well as that bottom-up uh, consumer or population uh, approach to greenhouse gas management. Um, one more point that uh, on this note, um, so during the, the last uh, presidential administration here in the U.S., uh, at the beginning of the administration, there was some concern that a lot of the progress towards uh, climate change, risk management, sustainability, energy management, et cetera, would be lost because there was not that high level national support from the, the presidential administration. And what we saw uh, was exactly the opposite. It was it was pushed by, uh, the, the progress there was pushed by industry. So uh, we saw cities stepping up, we saw businesses stepping up in order to proactively manage uh, energy, uh, proactively manage climate risk, et cetera. Uh, without that uh, that demand signal coming from the federal government itself. So uh, it really does run both ways. Great. Keith, we have one last question here. How do you include climate change in the structural design of buildings? Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, so uh, it depends what your risk is. Uh, so we'll we'll use something like hurricanes as an as an obvious risk factor. Um, so for designing buildings, uh, you know, in in areas that are prone to hurricanes, you would look at things like um, uh, how how strong your your roofing systems are, uh, how you know how wind resistant they are, uh, how wind resistant your um, your uh, wall materials are, uh, you know, things of that sort. Uh, there are, uh, I mentioned in New York City, uh, there are uh, flooding implications. Sorry, went brain dead for a moment. Uh, <laughs> in, in areas, in areas that are prone to flooding, you often see buildings that are that are elevated, you know, that are on stilts and whatnot. Uh, but we we are seeing building systems in new buildings in areas that could be prone to flooding. Like I said, uh, they're now designing those critical systems higher up so that even in the event of a flood, you're not wiping out your critical building systems. Um, there was an interesting study uh, a, while, a while back when, when Sandy hit that showed that the majority of the financial implications that came from FEMA or yeah, from uh, Sandy, excuse me, uh, were tied to buildings being just out of operation due to flooding of critical equipment. So it wasn't it wasn't that the building itself was damaged, other than it couldn't operate their HVAC, didn't have uh, you know water, couldn't be pumped to, to the building because all those systems were in the basement. So effectively, all of the people that had to be uh, you know, rehoused uh, during the repair of those buildings, all of that could have been mitigated by simply having critical building systems on a different floor. Um, variety of examples here. Uh, FEMA has some great resources on this, uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, NOAA has some uh, great examples uh, for how to mitigate this stuff. National Institute of Building Sciences and the whole building design guide has uh, great resources on, on these type of design changes that you can make uh, to your building system. So 
highly recommend that you reach out uh, to those organizations or if you just want a comprehensive list uh, you know there's a qr code there on the screen my email's on the screen feel free to reach out and i'm happy to give you some guidance and also for um we've got a, a huge um audience here from the UK, if you go to our website, uh, www.bsigroup.com forward slash um, e, uh, en-gb, that's the UK website, and you'll find a lot of information on that site as well, um, as well for the um, for the audience from the UK and Ireland as well. Um, right. Very interesting. One of, the, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the nice things about uh, climate risk planning is that uh, even if it's written by a, a national uh, mm -hmm. body or national organization uh, much of that can be uh, transposed in, into other uh, other areas of the world uh, without too much problem so yeah and of course uh, i've got an audience from canada as well and i think um our website address obviously is each of our countries has their own website address so there's a lot of information there but that's great keith we do have more questions coming in but i'm just going to do this last one so uh, we can wrap up uh, Keith, how do you think COP26 went? Should we have made higher targets or lower targets? And that's from CRN. So what do you think about COP26? We actually did a webinar on it once it was done. Uh, it was completed last year. But so how do you think about that, Keith? Lower targets, higher targets? How do you think the whole um, conference went? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that's a big question to unpack. But uh, <laughs> uh, COP26 as a whole, I, I, the thing that's important to realize about COP26 is that it is the first five-year cycle after the Paris Agreement. So um, countries agreed during the Paris Agreement in 2015 to uh, generate their national, uh, nationally determined contributions for greenhouse gas emissions going forward. Uh, so this was the first cycle of, of contribution to that. So um, it was it was a good start. Uh, and I, th I think what it did is it really uh, increased the trans transparency of what countries are currently dealing with. Um, it opens the conversation uh, and, uh, and helps people to understand where the challenges are. Uh, the COP26 certainly didn't solve all the, the challenges of greenhouse gas um, emissions, and we are uh, as we saw from the NDC synthesis report, we are not on track uh, to, to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement by 2050. Um, however, what it did is it showed that we need to put more focus on um, some of the immediate uh, energy efficiency and, and design factors that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the short term, and then start to think about uh, what we can do to really you know, dip those emissions in the long term. So. Uh, on one hand, it's great that we're talking about this. It's great that the, the transparency is there. Yes, there are still some existing challenges. We didn't solve all of the world's problems in, in five years, unfortunately, um, but more to come. So I, I think overall, uh, I would you know generally say it was a, a good start uh, to where we need to be. Great. I also want to thank John Wade here, who has made a comment. Climate forecast data is available, for example, climatedata.ca web portal. Thank you, John, for giving us that information. And with that, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And thank you, Keith, for a great presentation. All participants today will receive a link to the recording of this webinar, as well as links to our featured handouts, including the sustainability report, the little book of BIM and other content. However, in order to get this great material, you must complete the post-event survey, which is gonna pop up as soon as this webinar is completed. If you have any questions about BIM verification, kite mark, training or certification or sustainability, uh, consulting solutions or sustainability, the, uh, standards that Keith spoke about, please indicate this on the survey and we will get back to you right away. Once again, thank you all for attending and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Bye.